I'm going to start introducing our series, Welcome to Ecology Evolution Seminar Series, hosted by the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Adelaide. I'm actually, and I'm the co-convener of the seminar series and the researcher here at the School of Biological Sciences. Um, I'm joined by Bastian and my co-convener today. He's an associate professor and an AIS future fellow at the Institute of the Australian Center for Ancient DNA, also known as ACAM, which is one of the leading ancient DNA research centers in the world. Bastian will be presenting this fascinating research later in the series, so I'll be introducing more talking in the moments, so stay tuned. And also stay tuned for more ACAD members and alumni in the series. Our seminar team includes Wendy, Matt, and Jasmine, who are all joined here in the background, and they're doing amazing research at the University of Adelaide. They have been tired of more volunteering to facilitate the series. And we would like to we would like to thank um, Dr. Luca Fioranza at Monash University for allowing us to use the stunning image that you see that we used to promote the series. And also we'd like to thank Sam Legallo for designing the website and all the promotion materials. As a team, we would like to acknowledge and pay our respects to the Guana people, the traditional custodians of this ancestral land there that we are hosting this webinar. We would also like to know where you're joining us from. So please let us know in the chat line. And you can use the chat line to ask questions. Hopefully we will not run out of time. If you cannot address your question, Please feel free to contact us or the speakers, and you can are on the website or just scan the QR code at the moment. Speak. So, in our winter series, we are celebrating the 150th anniversary of Charles Darwin's book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, which was published in 1871. A truly revolutionary book continuing to impact our understanding of human evolution, which we will hear more in the series. Um, research on human origins is inherent since the Transdisciplinary, so we are thrilled to have leading researchers from around the globe across many disciplines. The series is packed with a fascinating collection of talks presenting the latest developments and discoveries on various aspects of human evolution. Our speakers today are Dr. Tarja Gernes, Doris Bailich, and Hannah Smith, and we are very thrilled to have them here with us. I'll start by introducing our first speaker. Dr. Sergei Gavrilets is a distinguished professor of ecology, evolutionary biology, and mathematics at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. He is the director of Center of Dynamics of Social Complexity, a research affiliate at the School of Anthropology at the University of Oxford, and external faculty at the Complex Science of Vienna. And he was also the associate director of scientific activities at NIMBIOS when it was active between 2008 and 2021. He's a recipient of Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship in 2008 and is a fellow of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a leading researcher in theoretical and computational evolutionary biology with extensive international collaborations, so he uses mathematical models and agent based simulations to study complex evolutionary processes in biological and social systems. I wouldn't be wrong to say that he single handedly cleared the muddy waters of theoretical research on speciation and laid the controversies to rest. In addition to providing many novel insights, his clarity of thought and amazing able to convey very complicated ideas and models truly captures anyone who reads his work. And his recent work, work focuses on human origins, which we will hear more about today. So, Sergey, see you. Um, yeah, so again, you're on mute, I think. Sorry, we cannot hear you. Hold on, we cannot hear you. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. There you go. So, 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 sorry, everybody. Um, yeah, what I was saying is that I was very grateful to Ajibul for introduce, introducing me and for organizing the whole thing and for inviting us all here. And I also wanted to thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, now, uh, let's uh, see if uh, uh, the screen sh sharing works. Is it work? Okay, great. Um, 
So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, an outcome of uh, several uh, projects that I was involved in over the last couple of years with uh, Pete Richardson and Franz De Waal here. Uh, so there are several uh, things that emerged. Uh, one is a series of educational uh, of teaching modules on cultural evolution. And now one is a special collection of the new journal, uh, Journal of uh, Evolutionary Human Sciences, a special collection dedicated to uh, this uh, anniversary of Darwin's book. Uh, we also had a very successful uh, webinar series last semester uh, with 12 uh, different speakers. And uh, last thing, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, we had a review paper uh, published uh, on similar topics. So I would encourage you to check, uh, to check uh, my website and there are links uh, to all uh, uh, these uh, outcomes. And it's been a very, very exciting uh, couple of years uh, working on this. So uh, um, in 1859, uh, Darwin published his uh, most famous book on the origin of species. Uh, and as far as uh, applica applying these ideas to humans, he had one uh, very short uh, cryptic uh, statement that in the future, uh, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. And clearly, it was something that Darren uh, viewed as an extremely important topic. And his uh, own worth is the highest and most interesting problem for the naturalist. But he didn't want to rush, and he took uh, 12 years uh, to come up with uh, uh, his new book and with uh, new ideas and new application of his uh, theory. And he clearly was uh, very proud of, what, of his accomplishments. So at the beginning of uh, his uh, Descent of Man book, he says that it has often and confidently been asserted that man's origin can never be known, but ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. And it is those who know little and not those who know much who are so positively assert that this, that this or that problem will never be solved by science. So I think uh, what he started uh, 150 years ago, we're kind of getting uh, close uh, uh, to finding uh, some answers. So what I will uh, do today, what I want to do is to look at the advances um, in our understanding of human origins through the lenses of modern speciation theory. And uh, in doing this, I will uh, highlight uh, some of the most important Darwin's insights. And I want to say right away that his book is very rich and there are many interesting and controversial topics there. Uh, I will not be trying to cover everything. I will just be looking on topics related to human behavior and also to emergent field of cultural evolution. So I will uh, kind of skip uh, a number of uh, important topics, for example, uh, sexual uh, selection, which uh, takes like almost a half of his book. So uh, um, modern speciation theory. Uh, well, um, systematic research on that started uh, with Darwin, of course, with his book, and then during the times of modern synthesis, um, uh, significant insights were done. Uh, but I think uh, the most intense phase of scientific investigation of uh, speciation started somewhere in the mid or maybe late 60s. And it's still going on, and a, lo a lot of, uh, uh, there are still a lot of uh, unknown and very important questions to answer. But I think uh, kind of some major insights emerged uh, about 15 years ago and were synthesized in, uh, in two books uh, that were published. One was uh, by uh, Coin and Orr was covering more empirical side of this question. And my book was looking at the theoretical, um, uh, uh, theoretical approaches to uh, speciation. And when uh, researchers look uh, at uh, speciation in a particular organism or a particular group of organisms, typically we identify where discussions and investigation focuses on three main uh, questions. Uh, the first one concerns the identity of the ancestor and different uh, characteristics and traits that this ancestor has that uh, simplified or allowed uh, a speciation process. Uh, the second Question concerns evolutionary forces responsible uh, for emergence of new uh, species. And usually it's some kind of selection, uh, ecological selection or sexual selection. It can be sexual conflict. It can be random genetic drift 
or mutational order. And the third question is about the most important uh, new traits, new characteristics that the new species possesses. And the focus is on genetic, morphological, behavioral, uh, spatial, and temporal uh, aspects uh, of and the new species. So uh, that's kind of the approach that I'm going uh, to take uh, to look at uh, human origins. So the ancestor. Well, uh, the Darwin's genius, what, what he clearly saw, that humans, like every other species, are a modified descendant of some pre-existing form. And for him, it was clear that this pre-existing form uh, are anthropoid apes. He also uh, made, uh, concluded that it was most likely that uh, our species originated in Africa than anywhere else. So uh, modern science, uh, modern science uh, uh, has confirmed uh, Darwin's insights. We now know that uh, primates originated, started diversifying it around about 65 million years ago, uh, after dinosaurs went extinct, uh, that humans and chimpanzees separated about six or eight million years ago. And we know that during uh, the process of uh, evolution of human, evolution of our ancestors, evolution, our species went through the stages that are pretty typical uh, for speciation processes. We divers diversified in a number of closely related lineages that occasionally hybridized. Uh, as recently as 35,000 years ago, there were maybe five uh, different uh, closely related uh, species, uh, sapiens, neanderthals, denisovans, and uh, a couple of other species. And during this time, um, a number of very important and interesting processes uh, happened. For example, uh, uh, the brain size uh, was increasing. And here there are two uh, graphs uh, showing uh, on, on this axis, on the horizontal axis, is brain capacity. Here is uh, the number of millions of years, past is at the bottom, uh, present here. Uh, and this is a different graph, uh, but, but sh showing uh, the same thing. And you can see there is a big jump in brain size here, um, about 1.8 million years ago. And one about half a million years ago, a process uh, started what looks like an exponential increase in uh, the brain size. So this is uh, very interesting. Uh, what about uh, ancestral traits and characteristics? Well, uh, again, in our Darwin's uh, conclusion was that uh, most differences between humans and higher animals are both of degree and not of a kind. And our ancestors had a number of very important uh, characteristics that were augmented and further developed in our species. We lived in fusion fission societies that put special uh, uh, demand on cognition and communications. We were involved in tool making, and uh, tool making was uh, also present in our, uh, is present in our species. We had a theory of mind, that means that we had, uh, we had understanding that our individuals had their own understanding of what's going on around. We cooperated, and cooperated was, is quite widespread in biology. Uh, we were characterized by empathy, empathy and the tendency to help ours. Uh, and I have here now a quote from uh, Darwin, besides love and sympathy, animals exhibit other quantities connected with social instincts, which in us would be called moral. Uh, we also used, uh, we also transmitted knowledge culture. And uh, cultural transmission and cultural uh, social learning are widespread in many our uh, groups of organisms, fish, birds, whales, and primates. If you're interested in this topic, uh, I would highly recommend a recent review with Andy Whitenhead uh, in science uh, just uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, so culture is present, but animals uh, they don't have much of cumulative culture, and of course, uh, they don't have language. Okay, so now we're moving uh, to selective forces. Uh, from biological research, we know that there are many myriads of different ways for organisms to adapt to their environment, to optimize survivability, fertility, and their mating success. And researchers in this field uh, identified a number of different triggers, key innovations, or crucial uh, transitions that presumably uh, simplified uh, the origin of our species. It was the transition of to bipedalism, uh, cooperative breeding, cooking, language, uh, sexual selection for larger brain, ecological dominance, and things like that. But uh, the consensus that has been emerging lately over the last 10, 15 years, I think, is that it was uh, uh, evolution of social learning uh, 
uh, community of culture and increased reliance on cooperation that were uh, driving our uh, evolution and that were the features that uh, dramatically increased uh, viability and fertility in our species. So next I will look at these two. So culture, what is culture? Well, there are many different definitions. Uh, one where uh, Peter Richardson and Rob Boyd advance is that social transmitted information that is capable of affecting uh, individual behavior. Uh, humans, uh, we exhibit uh, preference and abilities for social learning at very young age. Here I have two, uh, several graphs from a very interesting and uh, classical paper by Herman and co-authors. So what we did, we uh, put uh, uh, human kids on average two and a half years old and chimpanzees and orangutans uh, were in an age but, uh, uh, much older for a series of cognitive tests, tests. And what we saw that pretty much uh, characteristics were similar as, as far as uh, solving problems concerning space or quantities of causality, but uh, the most difference was observed in the ability of, uh, to learn uh, socially. There were some differences in, in the ability in theory of mind and also in the communication. But social learning, yeah, here is uh, on the vertical axis are uh, the proportion of correct answers uh, on, on different tests. So uh, this ability and preference for social learning is indeed uh, unique and it shows up very early. Uh, we also show striking levels of conformity with ours. We over imitate even uh, unnecessary actions. Uh, and human culture is a community. It accumulates over generations. And Darwin, he saw the importance of culture uh, for humans. Uh, have a couple of quotes here. Uh, evolution of humans depends to a subordinate degree on natural, no, natural selection. The more efficient causes of progress seem to consist of good education embodied in the laws, customs, and traditions, and enforced by public opinion. Uh, and the second quote is, I distinctly stated that the great weight must be attributed to the inherited effects of use and disuse with respect to both body, body and the mind. So um, um, what uh, he says in modern terms is that the role of agency in human evolution is very large and that basically what's uh, what was happening with uh, culture and genes were co-evolving. Uh, I want to say that uh, during the modern synthesis, uh, the founders uh, they fought a very uh, heavy battle uh, and uh, won this bargain uh, battle and rejected uh, the ideas of inheritance of acquired variation. But culture is part of in biology, is part of biology, and cultural evolution is clearly Lamarckian. I, I will return to this observation uh, at, at the end of my talk. Okay. So uh, culture and genes, they can evolve. And there are many similarities. Things like mutation, drift, migration, recombination, they happen both uh, with genes and also with cultural traits. But there are some unique features of cultural evolution. Uh, um, variation is not only random, but it can be guided. Uh, the mode of inheritance is different. You inherit uh, culture not just from parents, but pretty much from anybody in the current or past generations. Uh, culture evolves much faster. Uh, differentiation between different human groups in culture is much higher and has been measured uh, by FSTs. Uh, culture produces new selective forces, social norms and institutions. I'll talk about that later. And culture evolves with genes. Uh, there is a very uh, interesting idea that has been developed by a number of researchers now that we humans we went through the process of self-domestication. It was an example of uh, ancient culture evolution. And I think it's clear that our brains, hands, hands and uh, speech and motor control were also a uh, result of ancient culture evolution. Um, but um, the interest in culture uh, did not appear immediately after Darwin's book. Actually, the first attempt uh, to build the theory of cultural evolution was uh, happened only in the 40s and 50s of the late, uh, last century. It was Nikolai Rashevsky, uh, the pioneer of mathematical biology, who 
uh, attempt to do that. It was a very interesting person. Uh, he was the edit, founding editor of the first journal in mathematical biology. He also, uh, his work led to the establishment of the Society for Mathematical Biology uh, in, in 1972. And uh, he published uh, in the 40s and 50s, he published a number of papers, uh, theoretical papers modeling cultural evolution. And he actually had several books on that, that was also remarkable. Uh, and I particularly uh, like uh, his quote here at the bottom from here, uh, from 1954. Uh, and it says, problems of history may still turn out to be as inspirational for, for mathematicians as problems of physics have been and as problems of biology are bound to become. And he was right. Uh, in about 10 years, mathematical biology became, was started, started to be becoming a very mature science. Um, but uh, as far as uh, cultural evolution, um, things didn't well, work well. He was pretty much forgotten. And only 40 years later, when uh, Luca Cavalli's force and Mark Feldman, Rob Boyd and Peter Richardson, they published their uh, pioneering books and the field started. Uh, actually, again, it took, I guess, about 15 years and only into, uh, to around 2000, the number of papers and number of people working on this started growing exponentially, leading to the establishment of uh, the Society uh, for uh, cultural, uh, uh, cultural Evolution Society uh, five, five year, years ago. Uh, now, cooperation. Uh, well, um, Darwin uh, realized that cooperation uh, was quite common to most social animals and it evolved from tendencies for mutual aid and self-sacrifice. But fully his ideas were developed uh, by Pyotr Kropotkin, another very interesting person, uh, anarchist, socialist, economist, historian, uh, and he published a book, uh, Mutual Aid as a Factor of Evolution. Basically, uh, he was saying that cooperation was just one of the mechanisms of adaptation of an increased survival uh, common across all um, branches of, of, of life. Um, uh, in, in this book, he argued both against uh, social Darwinism, which uh, oversimplified uh, survival of the fetus, and against uh, a depiction of human nature as very good in, in the style of uh, Rousseau. Uh, I, I juggle how much time I have. I kind of lost time a little bit. Uh, five more minutes. Hmm? How much? Uh, five, but we can. You're on mute. Five plus questions. Okay. Uh, so, uh, cooperation is uh, quite common in biology uh, at all different levels. Uh, and, but in biology, it's usually based on genetic relations. Uh, in humans, it's quite distinct, it's distinct in diversity of types. It is distinct in scale and it regularly involves uh, non relatives. Uh, humans, again, where we start exhibiting preferences for cooperation at very early ages, we all cooperate by default and we're often willing to pay substantial personal costs to make cooperation successful. And we cooperate in large groups. Just a couple of examples of this. Uh, so, uh, as far as studying mechanisms of, of cooperation, uh, Kropotkin's ideas were kind of forgotten. Even now, his book is not really cited well. But now we know much more. Since the early 60s, uh, cooperation uh, became a very popular topic of research. Now we know a number of different mechanism, mechanisms of cooperation. It's genetic relatedness, uh, incentives, uh, altru pure altruism, reciprocity, reputation, group selection, and social norms. Okay, so now we have uh, established the ancestor, we established the selective forces, uh, but we still want to know more. For example, why our species emerged when it emerged? And that means during uh, the Pleistocene, during the last uh, couple of million years. And over the last decade, and maybe a little longer, uh, there is an increasing accumulation information that shows uh, where uh, the world where our ancestors lived was very specific. Uh, it was characterized by increasingly high frequency of fluctuations in temperature and in our characteristics. On this graph shows uh, the last uh, five million years, uh, and there is a measure here related to the temperature. Uh, past is on the left, present is on the right, and you see growing fluctuations. 
Uh, this second graph below uh, shows uh, the last 120 years with uh, kind of uh, the, again data related to the temperature, and this is a standard deviation. And you see significant increase in standard deviation about 80,000 uh, uh, years ago. But what is important is that why this is important is because mathematical models will show that culture is exactly the system for adapting uh, to this type of uh, environmental instability. Uh, interestingly, also because in our uh, major and very important transition in our history when environment stabilized uh, about 12,000 years ago, and that's when uh, cultures and civilizations, uh, well, when agriculture and civilizations uh, started to appear. Okay, but of course, if it's climate, but it was affecting uh, many different species, not just humans. So why us? Uh, Darwin, uh, he acknowledged that the gap, for example, in mental powers between humans and our animals was enormous. And Darwin clearly didn't uh, like gaps. Uh, a number of different hypotheses uh, 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 have been discussed, uh, and I kind of mentioned some of them. Uh, but I think um, the most obvious uh, answer uh, to this question is uh, a modified version of uh, the ideas that Engels and Washburn uh, put together about hands, brains, and tools. The idea is that transition to bipedalism freed hands, heads were used to, uh, to produce tools and to, use, uh, to learn how to use tools, you had to use cultural learning, uh, social learning, and you had to cooperate, and when we had, uh, this started as uh, a process of co-evolution of hands, uh, tools, and braids. That uh, produced, for example, with something like outline on this graph here. Okay, uh, so now uh, the third question uh, when you apply uh, speciation uh, theory is to look at some uh, distinctively uh, distinctive traits. And there are many of them I'll just outline for you. Life history changed dramatically when males and non-reproductive females started cooperating with parents to help uh, raise a large brain and helpless infants. And as a result of this, interbirth interval uh, dramatically decreased. Uh, it's about half of what it is in our apes, and human lifespan uh, dramatically uh, increased. Uh, language emerged. And as Darwin noticed, uh, the formation of different languages and of different of, and of distinct species, and the proofs that have have been developed through a gradual process are curiously the same. And indeed, languages evolve through the process of descent with modification. Uh, we now know that all necessary precursor for human speech, motor control, are present in, in closely related primate species. And the consensus is that uh, adaptations for complex vocal behavior must have already been in place before we split from Neanderthals uh, about half a million years ago. So why it happened in us and not in, uh, uh, in our apes? Well, um, apes, they largely lack motivation to share information. In, co in contrast, our ancestors, who were cooperators and social learners, they had strong uh, motivation uh, to do that. Uh, morality. Well, I already had uh, that quote uh, from Darwin uh, about uh, morality uh, and uh, about uh, its precursor in animals. But uh, his main emphasis uh, in trying to explain morality in humans was invoking uh, group selection. Uh, he had a very relevant quote where he basically said that groups that have uh, moral members where we will win competition against other groups and where it will spread their traits uh, across uh, uh, the whole human population. And modern research it does show uh, that uh, apes possess different building blocks of morality, such as empathy, sympathy, uh, conflict, ability to resolve conflicts and to follow uh, social rules uh, and the sense of fairness. Uh, but as far as uh, the ideas of morality, uh, we are much uh, broader now and much more in inclusive. Uh, the new theory of morality of cooperation, it postulates, and, and also there are data supporting this, that morality evolved as a set of uh, tools, in a sense, to solve problems of cooperation. And there are seven different types of cooperative behavior that are viewed moral across dozens of different cultures. And there's a help and kin, helping your group, reciprocating, being brave, and, and things like that. Uh, 
Another important uh, uh, new characteristic of humans is uh, social norms. And again, Darwin saw the, their importance. Uh, the expression of the wishes and the judgment of members of the same community serves as the most important secondary guide of conduct in aid of social instincts, but sometimes in opposition to them. Uh, in social sciences, sciences uh, people talk about two different types of social norms. Descriptive norms, it's just uh, statements about behaviors that are most common, but also about injunctive norms. And these are behaviors that people ought to do in a given social situation, even if doing so is against their immediate interests. And these injunctive norms are maintained by threats of social disapproval or punishment uh, for norm violation or by norm internalization. And I really like this quote from uh, uh, Mike Tamosella, but humans live in a sea of social norms that govern pretty much all aspects of their lives. And there is a very interesting emerging view that social norms are at the core of human cooperation. And besides social norms, we have social institutions that are basically the systems of social norms. And they are also clearly very important for us. So, uh, uh, I started by outlining the uh, three major insights for, from Darwin. Uh, so the first one, uh, where uh, humans are a modified uh, form of, uh, modified descendant of some pre-existing forms was clearly embraced uh, by modern evolutionary synthesis. Uh, the second one uh, about uh, cooperation was, I think, ignored by modern synthesis and it took about uh, 40 or 50 years after that be before cooperation uh, became a very important and hot topic. As far as uh, his conclusions about the role of culture and cultural evolution and inheritance of acquired variation, uh, that uh, insight was rejected uh, by major evolutionary synthesis. So these are kind of uh, some uh, general uh, conclusions, uh, general scientific conclusions um, uh, of this talk. Uh, but uh, this is just the last slide. Uh, it's about impl implications and its implications for our life. Uh, and I think there are many things we, we can still learn uh, and uh, apply uh, for, from this. If we want to make our society uh, better, societies better, there are certain things we always have to keep in mind. So there are biological roots of uh, whatever we do. Uh, there are genes, uh, we are driven by genetic relatedness, we are driven by, uh, well, there is a drive for sex, for power, prestige, uh, there is competition, uh, but also there is cooperation. So these are our genetic instincts. Uh, we're also uh, driven by things related to social learning. And social learning can be uh, enormously beneficial uh, because, well, we can um, get uh, uh, learn different things uh, from ours rather than inventing them when, themselves. But uh, social learning also constrains uh, our behavior and drives it. I mentioned already morality, social norms, social institutions and traditions. Uh, and then there is conformity, and this is a part basically of this process uh, and the ability to internalize norms. But this conformity and this ability and preference for social learning also makes us quite vulnerable uh, to propaganda and uh, different types of propaganda and to fake news. And finally, cooperation. Cooperation also can bring us enormous benefits due to economy of scales and uh, division of labor. And we've been cooperating in groups throughout our history, um, uh, cooperating against challenges uh, that nature put forward, against our groups, or sometimes uh, when there were conflicts uh, within our, our groups. As a result of this, we have very strong coalitionary uh, psychology, which, which can bring us together whenever we perceive that our group uh, faces some kind of challenge, but also can cause a negative and very hostile reaction to ours who differ uh, from us in their looks, behaviors, beliefs, or plus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergey. Um, thank you for. Um, you know, trying to summarize a huge amount of work in such short time, of course, it's not impossible to do justice, but thank you for sharing. Uh, we have one question in the chat line. Um, do you want me to read it out for you? Or, um, so it's from Riz Khan. Any developments on the origin and evolution of intuitions in humans? And are intuitions I discovered or are we, or we find any insights of them in other animals?
Um, well, um, there, there is some research in uh, social psychology uh, using the uh, experimental economics method where uh, subjects are put uh, to a certain task and then they uh, kind of given uh, a certain amount of time uh, where it, uh, is uh, controlled. And uh, what uh, uh, some of these experiments claim is that if uh, amount of time uh, is very short, if the answer needs to, needs to be found very quickly, when people uh, cooperate quite often. So in a sense, uh, they cooperate in an intuitive way. Uh, while if we have more time and are given the ability to reflect more, we can choose a more selfish uh, uh, de decision. So in, 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 in this say, sense, uh, yeah, we have a research on that. Uh, but uh, intuition is kind of a very uh, general term. It, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, whoever asked it was asking this or like we can talk about intuition as the ability to predict the future in a sense, right? So and, and that would be a very, very different uh, topic. Um, we have, um, yeah, we are running a bit um, out of time. If that's okay, we'll um, um, continue. Thank you, Sergey, again, for sharing. Um, our second speaker today is Dr. Laura Davis. Laura is an associate professor at the Department of Anthropology at Penn State University. She's also an alumni of Australian Center for Ancient DNA at the University, by the way. Um, she continues to collaborate here. Um, she has received many research excellence awards, which will take a significant portion of the allocated time to mention it all, but I'll just mention that she has successfully gathered many high-profile research grants from ARC, NSF, and NIH. Her research is at a fascinating intersection of medical sciences and ancient DNA. Laura uses classified dense of clay to reconstruct ancient human oral microbiomes. Her team was the first to reconstruct the microbiome of the other cells. She's now reconstructed the evolutionary history of the human oral microbiome on six continents and obtained insight into our ancestry lifestyles. And we are very excited to have her and dive into our research on ancient humans' microbiome and their evolution through time. Thank you, Laura. Great. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. okay. Awesome. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, as was mentioned, my name is Laura Weirich, and I am an associate professor at Penn State, and I also still maintain an affiliate position at the University of Adelaide. Um, and I'm very happy to be speaking to many fellow <laughs> Adelaideans, uh, many of whom I, I miss very much, and I wish I was able to visit Adelaide um, over this past year. I do want to take just a second to um, acknowledge that even though we are very physically dispersed, I'm sitting here in my attic office here at Penn State and State College, Pennsylvania, um, on the unceded lands of Susquehannock. Um, even though we are physically dispersed, I still want to acknowledge that we are all sitting on ancestral lands and, and pay respect uh, to elders past, present, and emerging. Um, I also do want to give you a warning that there are human remains in this talk if that's um, going to bother anyone. So many of the talks that you will hear about in this series all have to do with human evolution and thinking about the human body and how it's come to be. But I wanna challenge that for just one second and tell you that humans live in a microbial world and that the human body is actually only about 50% human. In fact, the human body is 50% microbial. Um, you thought you were human when you woke up today, but it turns out that you are actually just a host for many of the different microorganisms that you live on your body, live, live on and in your body. Um, so you are 50% microbial. <laughs> I know when I heard that uh, term for the first time, it really did shock me to think that I was more microbe than I was human. I thought I was a human. I thought I had, you know, cognitive ability, but no, you're just a, a shell for microorganisms. And these microbial, um, these microorganisms that live on and in the human body are what we refer to as microbiota. Now this can be bacteria, fungi, viruses, protists, archaea, you name it. Um, they live in very diverse communities. And eat, in, in every single one of us, there's over a hundred trillion bacterial cells. Um, and so that's a, that's a really huge number. It's very difficult to sort of visualize that, 
but there's over a thousand different species that live on and in every single one of us. Um, and this equates for about 1.4 kilograms. Can you tell it's late at night? I am just saying the wrong words. This accounts for about 1.4 kilograms of body weight um, in every single one of us. And this is analogous to your brain. And so it's as if you're carrying around an entire organs worth of microbes with you every single day. Um, and this has been an incredibly active area of research um, in the United States, but has also been a very burgeoning area in Australia as well. It's not just these microbes that are important though, it's the functional potential um, and the genomes that they carry with them that are so important um, for us to understand more about today. In fact, every single one of you contains two to five million microbial genes. And so if I was you know, really generous and said the human genome contains about 30,000 genes, that means that microbial genes outnumber your human ones 100 to one. So you are 99% microbial when it comes to the genetic information or the genes that are within your body. Um, and so this may explain why when we sequenced the human genome, we didn't have answers for how diseases evolved, how humans came to be, um, cures for cancer, et cetera, et cetera, because we only looked at 1% of the entire genetic makeup of the human body. So these microbial communities are obviously going to be very, very important for understanding how human physiology works um, and how humans have evolved and come to be today on this planet. These functions encoded in these genomes of these microbes are incredibly important for our daily life. So the microorganisms that live within your gut help you digest food and as a byproduct produce things like vitamin B and vitamin K, essential nutrients for you to function on a daily basis. These microorganisms also help you digest drugs and anything else you might put into your body. Um, in fact, you know, how well you uh, utilize a pharmaceutical or how you know, strong it hits you may actually be determined by the types of microbes that digest it in your gut. Microbiota also help you develop your immune system. They help educate it and train it and help fight off allergic disease if it's trained correctly. Um, they also help prevent infectious disease. And so these microbes are going to try to fend off pathogens that would wanna come into the same environment. Um, so they're quite good at protecting you from infection. And last but not least, they also help detoxify the body. So if you alter these functions, if you shift microbial communities such that the functions also shift, it makes a lot of sense that you would get disease. Um, and it was thought for a long time that these microorganisms might change in the face of disease, but that they couldn't necessarily cause disease, um, and that they wouldn't be a, a root level um, of human physiology. And in fact, um, this was overturned in 2006 by a study led by Peter Turnbaugh, who's now at Stanford. Um, and he was actually able to take microbiota from obese mice and transplant them into lean mice and cause that lean mouse to become obese. And so understanding that microorganisms can be causal in disease and that they can actually themselves change the physiology of a mammal or change the physiology of a being um, was really, really important to our understanding um, of, of disease origins and of you know, really human origins. Um, today though now, <laughs> microbiota have been associated with nearly every disease that's ever been studied. Um, if we were together in the same room, I would happily buy anyone a coffee or a beer if they could come up with a disease that has not yet been linked to the microbiota in some way. Um, metabolic diseases are typically related to microbiota in the gut, whereas oral diseases are more typically related to microbes in the mouth. Um, but oral and gut microbes have also been linked to a wide range of systemic diseases, including things like mental health. And so, you know, whether or not you have depression or anxiety may actually be related to the types of microbes you carry with you, both in your mouth and in your gut. So understanding the origins of these microorganisms and how they may have co-evolved with humans or may not have <laughs> um, becomes an incredibly important question. We need to understand not only the evolutionary history of the human, but also of its microorganisms. And by doing so, we'll probably be able to understand more about the origins of health and disease. So there's many different tools we can utilize to study the evolutionary history of the human uh, microbiota. And the tool that my team uses most commonly is called ancient DNA analysis. Um, ancient DNA just means genetic information from any old material where it wasn't intended to be preserved. And so you can obtain ancient DNA from things like soil, bones, feathers, hair, eggshells. Um, and in fact, you can go back almost 1.5 million years. That was the most recent um, ancient genome that was just published and authenticated. 
so you can go back quite a bit of time um, to really be able to understand how things have evolved and, and come to be on this planet. We do not typically obtain ancient DNA from amber um, or even from dinosaurs. They're much too old, so I'm sorry. Jurassic Park is probably not real. <laughs> um, and ancient DNA is also very difficult to obtain from Egyptian mummies. It's not impossible, but difficult um, because the embalming process can actually destroy DNA um, or fix DNA in ways that's difficult to um, get that back out. Um, it is very difficult to work with because um, ancient DNA is very fragmented. It's very chopped up into incredibly small, tiny pieces. Um, if you're a geneticist, our average base pairs and some of the anatols we looked at were 38 base pairs. Um, so it's very tiny, very fragmented DNA. It's also damaged. Some of the um, sequences in the DNA are actually wrong because the DNA has been um, you know, sort of degraded over time. And on top of that, it's also contaminated. It's mixed with modern DNA. And so, you know, you can imagine a soil sample has active bacteria living in it. Um, it also has that DNA from old bacteria that lived in it in the past as well. So we're looking at, at complex mixtures most days. Um, and so if we wanted to use ancient DNA analysis to look at the evolutionary history of human microbiota, there are a couple of sample types that we can use. Um, one is coprolites or preserved human feces. These are exactly what you think. <laughs> um, and they're very um, fun to look at, I think. Uh, this would be feces that's deposited by humans um, and left in a type of environment that allows preservation um, of the physical structure of it. Um, what's fascinating about this is that you can obtain gut microorganisms from copper lights, but it's also highly problematic as well. Um, we know that the bacteria in copper lights continue to decompose after they've been deposited. And so some microorganisms and copper lights actually resemble compost piles rather than the human gut. Um, and on top of that, uh, they also can be you know, mixed with environmental um, signatures from the soil, and they also cannot be tracked back to a specific individual. So you could have a bunch of copper lights, but they could all um, originate from the same person. So we are using a different sample type, and that is calcified dental plaque or dental calculus not mathematical calculus, dental calculus, <laughs> two different things. Um, and this is the tartar on your teeth that a dentist will scrape off with that little sonication machine. So when you go to the dentist and you hear them going, they're actually busting dental calculus off of your teeth. And so, you know, great if you have modern dentistry around to remove that from your teeth, not so great if you lived in the past um, where those tools and resources didn't exist. You would have built very large deposits of dental calculus on your teeth um, and uh, we would be able to go back in time and clean your teeth <laughs> if you're an ancient individual, remove that dental calculus, which is, is really hard. It's like cement. It's like a rock hard matrix. We'd be able to remove that dental calculus from your teeth and reconstruct the type of microorganisms that once lived um, in your mouth. And so this is an incredibly rich resource to reconstruct the types of microorganisms that lived in ancient humans and for us to really understand some of the origins of disease, especially diseases that relate to the oral microbiome today. And I was part of a team in Adelaide, um, as well as some other people here uh, on the call today, including Bashan Yamas, um, who were able to reconstruct the first microbiota from a dental calculus sample from ancient humans. Um, and we published this in Nature Genetics in 2013. And I think one of the more remarkable parts about this paper is the scanning electron microscopy that was published um, alongside. If you can see my mouse, um, this is a, a scanning electron microscopy image um, of dental calculus. And you can actually see it sort of growing in a tree ring like structure out from the tooth enamel. Um, and if you zoom in even further, you can even see the individual bacteria and the cocci and rod shapes that are um, what is sort of expected in a, in a dental calculus biofilm. So this was really exciting stuff um, and really sparked an entire new field of research, paleo microbiome research, um, which is what my group spends a lot of time thinking, breathing and, <laughs> and dreaming about. Um, and in fact, we have been busy reconstructing oral microbiomes from um, over uh, on six different continents from over 50 different ancient cultures. Um, and at last check, we're actually over 1600 ancient calculus samples at this stage um, that span over the last 48,000 years. We collaborate with lots of museums and archaeologists, but also local communities to ensure that their questions and their desires also get integrated into the research. So we can ask really deep evolutionary questions about how microbes have come to be in humans on this planet, but we can also ask questions that are relevant to local people. For example, you know, what were my ancestors' microbes and what does that tell us about the periodontal disease, for example, that I might have today? 
So um, if I just uh, zoom in on Europe, what I'll do is summarize many years of research um, into a model that we have for how European microbiota have come to be um, today in the modern world. And we did some research um, a few years ago that we published in Nature in 2017, um, where we were able to look at Neanderthal microbiota as well as a wide range of other ancient humans who live very different lifestyles. And the first change we were able to see in our microbiota was actually when um, ancient humans, hominids, and even primates shifted um, away from this sort of conserved oral microbiome. And that first shift happens when humans start hunting um, or at least consuming large quantities of meat. We find that individuals who are known to consume large amounts of meat um, have a significantly different oral microbiota than individuals who are known to forage or gather most of their food. Um, and so we're still looking into the mechanisms of this, but we do believe that hunting um, or meat consumption in large quantities is probably the first step that really moves the anatomically modern human microbiome away from um, Neanderthals and, and other, not even necessarily Neanderthals, but other primates. Um, the next step in this phase would have been um, sometime about 7,500 years ago when humans start practicing modern agri or well, agricultural practices. They're not modern agricultural practices, they're just agricultural practices. Um, and this is during the Neolith Neolithic Revolution in Europe. Um, we do see a significant change when individuals start consuming larger amounts of carbohydrates when they start growing grains. Um, you also get a lot of animal domestication during this time point. Um, and society looks very, very different, right? People start settling down um, into towns and, and communities um, and start metallurgy and, and whole bunches of, of new activities. So, so lifestyles shift significantly here. Um, and so the jury is still out as to whether or not this is diet or whether or not it's some other factor or feature um, during these revolutions. The next major transition where we see significant changes in the microbiome is actually during the Industrial Revolution, or I should say post-Industrial Revolution. Um, this is a, a time when, you know, you have a lot of new things going on in, in people's lives in Europe. Um, we're getting food mass produced for the first time. We're also sterilizing large amounts of our food and, and canning it, um, which really limits the sort of environmental exposures that one might have. Um, people's lifestyles and, and jobs are also changing. Um, and there's also some new um, medical and hygienic practices that start coming onto the market. Last but not least, we have evidence of a very recent change that's happened post-World War II, and we call this the Great Acceleration Change. Um, we're not exactly sure what's changing um, here. We, we, it could be antibiotics. Antibiotics are also introduced um, large scale after World War II, but it could also be the introduction of toothbrushing and toothpaste um, that really causes this shift. And so we're still, still looking into that, and that's an active area of research. So in Europe, we have this model for how we went from an ancestral shared hominin microbiome to the type of microbes that we would have today. Um, but a lot of this research was done using calculus samples from different communities um, and different areas as proxies for people who live different lifestyles. And so of course you can have geographic confounding, you could have other issues that, that sort of um, alters some of the conclusions here. And so what we decided to do was focus in on one particular geographic area in Europe and really get to the meat of this. Okay, what do we see as far as the evolutionary history of one specific area? And my graduate student, Andrew Farr, decided to focus in on the United Kingdom. Um, and he looked at 127 different individuals uh, throughout the United Kingdom and tried to understand how the oral microbiome would change in one location um, and largely within one culture, as many of these individuals um, are from London um, over at least a 1200 year period. Um, and what's fascinating about this study is that um, if you reconstruct microbiota from, uh, from people in the UK over the last 7,000 years, is that you see two very distinct types of microbiota start to emerge. Um, one is a, is a group that is dominated by Streptococcus here, shown in red, and the other is a group dominated by an archaeal species called Methanobrevibacter. Um, what's fascinating is the streptococcus uh, type of microbial communities that we see are actually very similar to what we see in modern Europeans, um, suggesting that that may be a precursor to the modern industrial sort of oral microbiome that many of us share today if you have European heritage. Um, and the group two is, is largely lost. We really don't see methanobrevibacter um, in modern humans at all, except for people who are suffering from very severe periodontal disease. Um, now there's a multitude of reasons why this could exist, um, but one of the hypotheses we decided to look into was actually looking into changes in diet. 
And so we decided to look at the microbial functions again to see what are those microbes actually doing? What sort of foods might they also be eating that you know, the human body is also consuming? <laughs> um, and what we, dis what we um, very strikingly saw is that the streptococcus group that's similar to what we see in modern people also shares functions that are analogous to a very modern industrialized diet. Um, and so this suggests to us that shifts in diet through time, specifically shifts and in increase in meat eating, um, low fiber, high sugar, dairy-based diets um, really probably cause the selection for the types of microorganisms that we see today um, in people living at least in the UK. Um, and what's fascinating about this is we actually see the streptococcus groups um, become more prevalent post-1300. Um, and we really um, have been able to find significant differences in shifts in oral microbiota that correspond to um, Yersinia pestis outbreaks or, or the Black Death. Um, in the UK. And so um, it's sort of well known that meat eating uh, drastically increases after the Black Death. Um, and we think that we're actually seeing that reflected here in the microbiomes of people from the UK. So we know that diet plays a role in the evolution of our microbes, um, at least in our mouths and the body, and certainly probably in the gut and elsewhere. Um, and it's, it's now very interesting to think about how these ancient um, or even historic evolutionary processes may continue to influence the types of microbes that we have in our mouths today. And much of my research um, in the past few years has really focused on interpreting these evolutionary changes into modern medical practice and into the origins of diseases that we observe today in modern populations. Um, and to give you a, a scale, an idea of the, the large scale impacts that some of these historical processes can have, um, we did a large meta-analysis and this was research done by one of my PhD students, um, Musli Abdul Aziz, where we compared all oral microbiota data from people living industrialized or European um, lifestyles or of European heritage to people from all over the world living traditional lifestyles. Um, so this would be analogous to hunting and gathering um, or you know, living a, a very um, non-industrialized lifestyle. Um, and we find that industrialization or um, you know, living this sort of modernized industrialized lifestyle is the single biggest factor that drives the types of microorganisms that we carry in our mouths. Um, we still don't know if that's a historic relic, that that's really um, you know, something that's a hangover from what happened several years ago, or whether or not it's an active process of things that people are undergoing today. Um, it's certainly probably a mixture of both. Um, and so we're, we're really keen to understand how these historic industrial practices may be continuing to influence the types of microbes that we see today around the world um, and even in specific locations. And so another area of research that we've been actively pursuing is working with um, indigenous communities to try to reconstruct their oral microorganisms and understand whether or not these could be related to um, differences that we see in, in health and disease across different populations. And so this work has largely been led by Matilda Hensley Davis, who I think might be on the call, um, <laughs> really looking at Aboriginal Australian oral microbiota and trying to understand um, whether that, that's different from European Australian microbiota and whether or not that could potentially be linked to uh, disease origins in, the, in these populations. Um, and this is really, really important because we know that Aboriginal Australians uh, suffer in some populations up to 3.5 times higher levels of tooth decay and up to 10.8 times higher levels of periodontal disease. And so we know we have a big disparity here in oral health um, in these populations. And some of that can be socioeconomic or access to healthcare, but projects like Close the Gap in Australia have really failed to improve the sort of rates of disease as they should have. And so I think we need to be thinking about the evolutionary history of people's microbes. And we need to be thinking about how those unique evolutionary histories may have resulted in distinct sets of microbes that may contribute to disease in different ways. Um, and in fact, in Aboriginal Australian adults, we can see signatures that are linked to their deep connection to country. And we do in fact see that Aboriginal Australians living in different locations um, with different long-term heritages have different microbes present in their mouths. So we certainly think that the evolutionary history of microbes can contribute to some of the health disparities that we see today, especially between indigenous populations and those living in industrialized lifestyles. So once we identify these sort of issues and we can factor in evolutionary histories um, into understanding disease, what's the next step? And that's really to develop therapies that can target and treat the oral microbiome. 
And so it's thinking about disease, not from the disease itself's perspective, but from the microbial perspective, um, and really thinking about how certain microbial communities may underpin disease. So all of you are probably familiar with altering your microbiome using probiotics. Many of you probably had yogurt this morning, um, or maybe you're taking one of those little probiotic pills that I saw um, <laughs> when I was living in Australia. Um, and these are ways of, of putting microbes that are usually highly anti-inflammatory into the human body. Um, many of these microbes, though, are not well designed to live in the human body. They're used to do things like ferment milk in the case of yogurt. Um, and so they don't survive and they don't do well, which is why you need to eat yogurt every single day um, to sort of see the effects of that. So another um, method that's been developed is um, the use of prebiotics. And this can be things like fibers um, or certain nutrients that actually help bugs that already exist or bacteria that already exist in your body grow really well. And so you're sort of providing additional food for beneficial microbes in the body to improve how well they're doing um, rather than trying to put new microbes in. You can also use phage therapy to try to take certain sets of microbes out of the microbiome. Um, phages are viruses that are incredibly specific to individual bacterial species. And so you could use that to selectively try to manipulate which microbes you might wanna remove. There's a fourth option, um, and that's actually using microbial transplants. Uh, microbial transplants have been used successfully in the gut, and so this is a fecal microbiome transplant. Um, it is basically a fecal milkshake and a turkey baster. Uh, with <laughs> and there have even been machines invented to help um, grow lots of stool microbiota to help for transplantations. Um, and here's one of those machines, which has very cutely been named the repopulator. Um, it wouldn't be a good microbiome talk without a few poop jokes. Um, but what we are doing in collaboration with colleagues at the University of Adelaide, um, including Lisa Jameson, as well as Peter Zilm, is actually developing oral microbiome transplants. And so the idea here is to um, take dental plaque from ultra healthy donors and actually use that to um, help treat diseases like severe caries or periodontal disease, where we really need to shift the oral microbiome significantly in a way to support health. And I think we can develop oral microbiome transplants that are incredibly effective um, and very much tailored to someone's disease um, for better efficacy if we can understand someone's evolutionary history. Um, what we don't wanna do is, is wipe out someone's evolutionary history of their microbes. Um, and so we need to really be developing these therapies with our evolutionary history in mind to really make sure that they're tailored in the best way possible. So with that, I'll just leave you with a couple lingering questions um, that you can mull over as you have your lunch today. Uh, the first one is, what's the history of your microbiome? What was your great, great, great grandmother doing? Um, and how does that influence the sort of microbes you might carry with you in your body? And how does this, influence, this history influence your health? Um, do these particular microbes make you more susceptible to getting a cold? Or maybe do you not respond to paracetamol as well as you should because of those microbes? And last but not least, what will you do today that might alter the evolutionary history of your microbes moving forward? Um, <laughs> is that cheeseburger you ate or that sugary drink um, that you consumed going to influence the type of microbes that you might pass down to your children someday? Um, so with that, I just wanna say thank you to um, the huge range of individuals who have helped out on a lot of the projects today, um, including uh, many of the members of the Australian Center for Ancient DNA, um, as well as uh, the team at Penn State, um, which is rapidly growing. And I see some of the members are, are on the call today too. So um, I'm really looking forward to questions and to um, a very fun discussion session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura, for a fascinating talk. I mean, there's so much information to digest and implication on the personal level, which is um, not great to hear, of course. But thank you. Um, so um, I'll if any questions on the chat. But, um, I have one question. Do you how much radiation do you see in the ancient um, samples that we got? Um, in, in the same area, um, similar time span. Of course, if you have many samples, I don't know what sample size you got. Yeah, um, it really depends on where you're looking at and what sort of culture you're examining. But if we use the British example, um, you know, we looked um, basically at 60-ish individuals in London that spanned a thousand years. Um, and we can detect completely different oral microbial communities. Um, now, there's a lot of factors that, that play into that, right? So um, depending on where the dental calculus grows on your tooth, whether or not it's above the gum or below the gum can play can play a role in that, um, but also diet and disease and, and many other factors can also um, can also sort of weigh into that. But 
But um, at least in ancient Britain, we can pull apart completely different oral microbial communities. There might be a few species that are shared, but if you look at co-occurrence networks, they're completely different structures. Um, and so it really says to us that there's, there's more variation, I think, than was previously appreciated. There are certainly um, handfuls of species that are really well conserved across the entire hominid tree. Um, and that's really exciting as well, right? To know that there's sort of core species that are always maintained, but there's certainly, we would say at least 20% of the microbiome that's incredibly variable um, across different cultures and groups and populations. Um, I think there is a question. Um, do we know whether there's an interplay between microbiome evolution and cultural evolution? I think this person was in my head during, <laughs> during the first talk because that's exactly what I was sitting there thinking about. Um, you know, cultural evolution, we talk about how it may leave sort of Lamarckian signatures um, in our genomes, but it can also leave imprints on our microbiome. Certainly the people that you interact with, the cultures that you have contact with, you know, you're, you're sharing microbes. You're, you're going to be swapping microbes. Your microbes are gonna be adapting to new environments um, and new practices. And so, you know, I think um, looking at how a microbiome responds to cultural practices could give, could give you mechanistic insights, right? Into the biology behind cultural evolution, um, which is really, really exciting. I have to say, I mean, um, bouncing on Sergei's and, and, and your talk, Laura, I mean, definitely there's a lot of connections there. I mean, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask Sergei's was like about mechanisms basically for cultural evolution, um, relationship with biology. Um, anyway, during your talk, you were focusing a lot on health. Um, can we use the microbiome as well to um, say something about human migrations, movements around the world? Yeah, we can use the microbiome to say all sorts of things. And I, I didn't really get into that today. Um, and so you're completely right. One of the things we can do is, is use actually the evolutionary signatures within microbes to track back human migrations, right? Um, handfuls of microbes in our mouths are transferred directly from sort of parent to offspring. And so they have a hereditary signature in them. Um, and we can absolutely sort of use that to, to understand um, you know, relationships between people and, and really track back very deep um, migratory signatures based on that sort of hereditary information. Um, we can also examine tons of other diseases and, you know, many other sort of factors that have come along in calculus. I mean, other groups have looked at um, some of the proteins and, and some of the chemicals that are in calculus that can be indicative of people's um, jobs and their professions. Um, and we've recently actually been using oral microbiomes to predict systemic diseases that people would have had. Um, and so, you know, the osteological paradox where people are dying, <laughs> but there's no sort of evidence of, of you know, what, um, what people who are living are dying of, um, you know, and we can also track back sort of invisible diseases as well um, by looking at microbes that may have very specific key roles um, in health today. And so a lot of that work's being led by Abby Gans, who's in my group at, at Penn State. Um, and I, I think this is just the beginning, right? Microbes are, are gonna continue to tell us a lot more about the past um, that I think we probably couldn't even imagine right now. Thank you, Laura. Um, we have one more question in chat, I will, I'll get back to it if we have time. Um, I just want to um, introduce our third speaker for today, um, Dr. Tanya Smith. She's a professor at the Australian Research Center for Human Evolution and Griffith Center for Social and Cultural Research at the Griffith University. She was a research fellow at Max Planck Institute and assistant professor, then an associate professor at Harvard University. She moved to Griffith University as an associate professor in 2016. She's now an ARC future fellow. Um, Tanya works on human evolution and biology by studying TIP as well. She uses histology, chemistry, advanced imaging techniques to study tooth structure and sheds light on aspects of human life history, growth, and reproduction. Her research reveals how living and fossil homo sapiens have prolonged a period of data development in comparison to now that else and other continents. And we are very thrilled to have, have her here and hear her um, tales that the two will tell. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you today. Um, I'm, I'm going to just acknowledge I'm coming to you from the Gold Coast hinterlands, which is the land of the Yukon people. And I work at the Gold Coast campus of Griffith University, uh, which is the land of the Kamlamiri people. Um, really just delighted that, uh, that Sergey and Laura set the stage so powerfully for uh, just aspects of evolutionary theory that 
we can probe using, uh, you know, both cultural paradigms as well as uh, physiological information. And I'm going to take that into even a more specific case study today. Um, but I want to just also just point to the power of some of the evidence we have in the fossil record, um, specifically teeth, which are the most well represented uh, form of evidence for past human species. We have just a few dozen skulls and skeletons in the seven million year history of hominin evolution, but we have thousands of teeth. And as I hope to convince you today, the uh, record of aspects of our development, our evolution and our behavior that we find inside these humble uh, elements is really profound and, and without, without peer really. Um, I've spent the last 20 years working on uh, using histological techniques to be able to mine the faithful records inside of teeth. And so in my lab at Griffith University, I create thin sections of various primates and humans in order to recognize these incredible tiny timelines, which we can see by using uh, microscopy, polarized light, even synchrotron imaging. And what you're looking at here is this uh, remarkable record of the daily and near weekly growth of a 13 million year old ape from Pakistan. You're seeing lines that are crossing diagonally in your computer screen, which represent nine days uh, between each pair. And you're seeing tiny little light and dark boxes, which are actually 24 hour or circadian rhythms that were the product of the cells as they were secreting the enamel, as well as the dentine that make up tooth crowns and roots. And this work has been underpinned by careful experimental studies of animals that have been given markers to be able to really tease out the relationship between these structures and the timed nature of their formation. So there's a, a solid body of work that's established that these are faithful biological rhythms that uh, are at play throughout our childhood as we're growing and developing, even before we're born. And by being able to mine the system, we can create this very elegant temporal growth map, if you will, of an, an individual's early life history. Here you're seeing a cross-section of that same chimpanzee tooth that I had showed you earlier, um, imaged with light microscopy. And I've actually been able to pick up very important key events in this individual's life starting with birth, which is actually the green line on the lower left, and continuing throughout the first few years of the individual's life, picking up events of developmental disruption in some instances, as well as the regular formation of the tooth crown, the enamel, which is on the upper part of the section, and the dentine, which is underlaying the crown and forming the beginning of the root. In this case, I was able to count all these these tiny timelines and come up with an estimate for how old this individual was when it died, when it stopped forming this tooth. My estimate was 1,396 days. And when I asked the biologist, uh, when, you know, how old was this chimpanzee from field records, he said it disappeared at 1,372 days of age. So at, at worst, I was 24 days off from its true age or 2%. Uh, error effectively in, in terms of being able to reconstruct this individual's history. So the system of registry of time persists in the fossil record. These lines are not re, uh, remineralized by um, you know, modification in the same way that bone tissue turns over in response to use. So we have this really faithful registry of our early life written down in the structures that make up our teeth. And not only do we have the time history, but we're also gonna have, and we'll see today, a chemical history, which tells us a lot about ancient climates as well as ancient behaviors, migrations. Um, and so I'd be happy to give you a, an example of that. And this really relates to a theme that Sergey talked about or touched upon, which is this issue of climate. And Darwin really emphasized in The Origin of Species, you know, climate is a, is a major cause of biological variation. We can, we can imagine that species are adapted to the environment they're found in. And when those environments change, that creates you know, an adaptive pressure uh, or a selection pressure that leads to adaptation. And in the, in the realm of human evolution, there's been a, a number of people who have pointed to variation in climate as a key driver in speciation and the origins of our own species, as well as the hominin, certain members of the hominin lineage, and even the great apes, that perhaps there were these periods of climate instability that really sparked uh, the origins of various groups in the human and primate fossil record. 
And obviously this has been a big issue in terms of you know, Neanderthals as well, whether climate variation may have led to, uh, to the end of the Neanderthals. And um, one of the problems though, in getting at some of these interesting and arresting ideas is that it's been very hard to get at climate change or, um, or specific you know, uh, cycles during the histories of people who lived in the past. Many proxies for paleo environments are based on things like ice cores or sedimentological records, pollen, um, things that are often sampled on the scale of tens of thousands of years. Rarely has it been possible to get at the specific um, changes that would have occurred during a person's lifetime. Um, one of the more promising ways of getting at this has been using the fossils themselves to um, recover um, oxygen isotopes. And people have spent the last few decades working on teeth as well as bone uh, because of the potential for oxygen isotopes to give us more specific information about what the environment was like when that individual was living. However, there've been some problems with some of these approaches. Often in the past, people have just drilled a tooth and taken a single sample. You get a single value, but that doesn't really tell you what was going on throughout that individual's history. Um, and for those who are not terribly familiar with oxygen isotopes, just the big picture here to understand and interpret some of the information I'm gonna share is to appreciate that there's just a couple naturally occurring atomic variants of oxygen in the environment. Um, and uh, the most common form is uh, oxygen 16. Um, and for those of us working on paleoenvironmental reconstruction, we're often keen to measure both the oxygen 18 and the oxygen 16 because they move through the environment in a, in a predictable manner based on meteorological cycles. And so when you think about how water uh, in surface pools basically moves depending on whether it's warm and evaporation is occurring or whether it's um, raining or cool and uh, snow or other forms of water is moving through the environment, glaciation, for example, we can actually use measurements of the ratio of these different light and heavy oxygen isotopes to reconstruct what was going on in that particular environment over time. And so the main aspect of this to, to even try to keep in your mind is just to understand that again, the ratio between these two light and heavy uh, isotopes, which is often called delta O18, that would be found to be in hard tissues, um, higher during warmer or drier cycles and lower during wetter or cooler cycles. And so using again, this no knowledge of how teeth grow, coupled with knowledge of the isotopic chemistry of teeth, we've been able to reconstruct ancient paleo environments on the scale of a human or a Neanderthal lifespan. And in the study that I'm gonna describe now, just to give you an example of the power of it, um, we worked on two Neanderthals found in Southeast France and one modern human child from the same archeological site. And I created thin sections of them. I worked through the temporal mapping as I showed you before with the chimpanzee. Um, and then we use two different mass spectrometry methods to be able to get at that oxygen isotope record, as well as to look at um, trace element distributions, which I'll um, explain in just a moment. And the, the overview we took and the way that I work with all um, samples that I'm privileged to have uh, access to is to really create first a, a nice three-dimensional record using micro CT scanning. So we've got a permanent replica of, of the sample, and then to create this physical thin section that allows us to, to map all this temporal information. And here in this example, you can see this modern human uh, molar, um, which I've created the thin section from. And in the lower right, you can see the temporal map. And in, in this case, I was able to find birth, which uh, occurred 40 days after the tooth began calcifying, and then work out a history of stress lines, as well as the total time it took to form this molar cusp. And then we took that same thin section and we subjected it to laser ablation, ICPMS, uh, which gives us a very high resolution record of the elemental chemistry of the tooth. And then finally, we used an ion microprobe to get out the oxygen isotope variation. Um, and I've had the great pleasure since moving to Australia almost five years ago of collaborating with Ian Williams at ANU, who is one of the pioneers of the shrimp technology or the sensitive high resolution ion microprobe which is a really fancy mass spectrometry system that uses a gun to bombard uh, samples with a very high uh, power um, 
sputtering effect. And that allows us to take tiny little measurements of samples. And so in this instance on the right, you can see that same thin section with a series of little dots following along the enamel dentine junction. So from the upper right-hand corner at the very beginning of tooth development, we took basically weekly samples all the way from before birth until the end of crown formation, just over three years of age. And you can see in that little inset, the uh, magnified image, each one of these little samples is about 20 microns in diameter, these tiny little spots. So that's representative of just a few days of enamel formation. So each little sample is giving us that um, on about a weekly basis. And we were able to compare this shrimp sampling approach to a more conventional oxygen isotope sampling approach. I won't bog down with the details unless there's questions, but um, we were able to validate this using the gold standard technique, which involves uh, silver, silver phosphate microprecipitation. And we use this with a, a sheep that had been um, raised under experimental conditions. And we were able to show near, near, uh, near identical values for the shrimp value measurements as opposed to the more classic measurement. So we're really getting a signal from the phosphate. And we're also picking up um, meteorological events. In this case, you can see two um, vertical lines, which represent water changes. And the animal um, was given isotopically um, varied water at those points. And so we're picking those up within about a week or so. So this gives us confidence that not only are we able to pick up the phosphate signal of the oxygen isotopes, but we're really picking up real meteorological changes in near real time. We also used a laser ablation mapping, and this is another technique really pioneered in Australia by a team in Sydney uh, over a decade ago. And they, um, in this instance, used a laser system and rastered that across cut sections of teeth to be able to come up with quantified distributions of different elements, often elements that were found in um, low concentrations, which we would call trace elements, but you also map things like calcium, which are found in high abundance in teeth. And so here you're looking at a color map of a baby tooth of a, of a modern human. Um, it's oriented in kind of a funny way. The crown is to the left and the, and the developing root would be to the right. And this individual shows low concentrations of strontium in blue and high concentrations in red. So you can see here in this case, um, kind of a, a signal that re reflects the in vivo or the lifetime dietary um, input into this individual. So when the individual was born and began breastfeeding, um, you could see the strontium values that were increasing. And we did, a, again, a validation study with this technique prior to the Neanderthal study, looking at modern human children of uh, known breastfeeding histories, as well as some captive macaques. And in this instance, we were really keen to get at uh, an element called barium, which is enriched in uh, mother's milk. And so barium turns out to be a really great marker, both of birth, because on the left here, you can see in these deciduous teeth, um, higher values right after the individuals were born, as well as it's a marker of weaning because it tends to fall uh, after milk is withdrawn during the end of the nursing process. So we were able to validate that these um, chemical records in teeth are accurate reflectors of the initiation of milk intake, as well as the cessation of milk intake. And so now turning back to the Neanderthals and the modern human from Southeast France, I just wanna give you the highlights here as a, again, kind of a case study to show the power of how teeth can help us to get at some of these key questions in human evolutionary studies that, in, that were raised even with Darwin in the, in the 1859 volume. So the oxygen isotope information from the modern human is what I'm showing in this figure. And just to remind you how we had done that sampling, you can see that tooth on the left with the temporal map as well as the approach that we took analytically. And so you're able to see the oxygen isotope values. This is the ratio of uh, 018 to 016 here showing a little bit of uh, seasonal fluctuation. You can see a rise after birth and at about a year or just shy of a year, you can see a high point there. So a warmer period and a drop off to a winter season. And then again, a rise to what we would consider to be a summer season. Overall, these values uh, tend to range from about 18 to 20 per mil. And what was more interesting was then when you look at the two Neanderthal children, uh, both of these two Neanderthal children show lower oxygen isotopes. So I, I put the dotted line in at 18 on all three of these data sets to show you that the Neanderthal children here um, tend to range on average from about 16 to 18 per mil, with a little bit of a bobble above and below. But that's suggestive of these two children coming from a cooler 
period, as well as what you can notice as well, there's more variation from season to season. So we're actually seeing the, these Neanderthals um, consistent with the broader paleo environmental indications um, coming from a colder, more seasonal environment. And we know that the Holocene in Europe, you know, 5,000 years ago was a warmer and less extreme uh, varying environment. So, so the oxygen data are consistent with the sort of broader paleo environmental reconstructions, but they're giving us even finer information about these children's early lives. Um, and again, we're seeing that from the absolute values as well as the range of variation. So now I wanna pair this with the trace element data and then I'll give you the big picture about why I think this is so interesting for probing some of these bigger questions in human evolution. Um, the first Neanderthal child here, I'll just show you one of two. Um, here's the mapping from the trace element information. And it's a little bit complicated because the teeth show some burial um, effects. But the big picture here is that there's biogenic or um, lifetime banding reflective of this um, Neanderthal child's nursing history starting at birth and going to about two and a half years of age, the barium values are elevated. And so that's suggestive of about a two and a half year period of breastfeeding, which is very similar to uh, modern humans from traditional societies. Um, surprisingly though, we didn't just find uh, barium banding, uh, we found some really fascinating lead banding. In the same tooth, we uh, are showing you the lead relative to the calcium. And you can see these different zonations or these regions of lower and higher lead with a very punctuated lead event towards the end of tooth crown formation. And this is really surprising. We weren't expecting to see biogenic lead. This would be lead that was imbibed or inhaled uh, by these children uh, during their lifetimes. And it wasn't just this one Neanderthal child. It was actually the second one also showed lead, uh, biogenic lead during its early life. Um, it didn't have barium in that second individual. And that's not surprising because in that case, I was looking at a second molar tooth, which wouldn't have started to form until about two and a half to three years of age. However, it did show lead exposures as well. So just putting out all of this together, and this is why I think it's kind of really neat to be able to see these two different chemical stories with the temporal information all in one, um, we can reconstruct ancient seasons effectively a quarter of a million years ago um, with relation to the individual's age and their nursing history. So um, I've put on the left here that oxygen isotope map with the ages of the lead exposures in blue, along with an illness, which is a period of really uh, punctuated high barium, and, and then intersperse that with the nursing information. And so on the right is kind of my textual summary of that. We can say with great confidence that this Neanderthal child was born in the spring when it began suckling. Um, and at nine months of age, it was exposed to uh, some fair degree of lead enough to show up as a distinct band. And that happened at the coldest time of winter in its first uh, year of life. And then one year later, uh, at the coldest time of winter, it, it was ill, so ill that it looks like it's, it's tapped its skeletal stores of calcium. And then just a couple months after that, it was again exposed to lead, a very high concentration of lead. And then finally, at about two and a half years of age, that Neanderthal stopped breastfeeding and the record ends at about 2.8 years of age in this instance. So this is the, you know, this is sort of in, in a sense, the most um, comprehensive approach that we've been able to take to ancient paleobiology, which is a, an approach that we're now leveraging to be able to apply to uh, larger collections of individuals in the past. And so just as a quick commercial and also an opportunity for uh, potential collaboration, you know, we're extending this approach both to look within the region, the Asian Pacific region at recent humans, as well as non-human primates. Um, there's been some really interesting hypotheses about, you know, paleo environments in the past uh, being quite different from contemporary periods and that humans may have come through this savanna environment to be able to reach down into, uh, you know, the, the region that some of us are in today. Um, we're also looking in equatorial African primates to be able to look at climate variation in relation to ecological variation. And this has relevance for um, ape evolutionary hypotheses about climate change driving the origins of great apes. And then finally, um, I'm starting a future fellowship in just a couple weeks to apply the same approach to look at um, children from various cultural transition periods. Um, specifically looking at early agriculture and trying to test some of these hypotheses about life history evolution and whether in fact children were uh, being nursed for shorter periods of time and whether they may be an in environmental interplay with some of those behaviors.
So I will um, just put in a quick plug for the paper that I just described, as well as a more recent paper and a popular science book that kind of gives a broader overview of how teeth can better help us understand our evolution, our behavior, and our development. And um, I hope we've got a couple minutes for questions. I want to thank our hosts, and, um, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. That was really fascinating. It's amazing that you can get so much fine detail on so ancient history. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, I have one question before um, we have questions in the chat. Um, do you, how much of the variation can you account? I mean, it's all sampled, of course, but I was wondering how mobile they were and that you can get anything to the spatial variation. Um, yeah, that's know. a great question. Um, I, you know, I, the Neanderthals, we know, for example, in that study, um, you know, probably were moving within, you know, 20 plus kilometers based on uh, hypotheses about um, resourcing, as well as the fact that we know there were multiple deposits of lead in natural environments within, uh, you know, 20, 25 kilometer radius. But I, I think it's highly unlikely they would have been moving so far that they would have been encountering water sources that would have been isotopically so different to explain the variation we see. And, and I'll say that because I know, for example, with the orangutans I've been sampling, we see even greater variation and they're not going anywhere. <laughs> so I don't think the, the signature in oxygen isotopes is actually a migration signature as often as it's a seasonal signature, particularly in non-industrial you know, non environments. Um, thanks. Well, thanks for your question. Um, do you have predictions on the origins of the lead or why these were consumed by those neonatals? Uh, great question. Uh, again, we've, we know from historic records that lead has been mined in this region in Southeast France in the last hundred years. Um, so it's, it's possible that they may have been taking shelter in the wintertime in caves or uh, parts of the environment that you know, were closer to these natural deposits. Um, you know, whether they were drinking water that was contaminated by lead or burning um, you know, lead can actually get into the body through inhalation. So if they were burning something in an environment where lead was being ignited, uh, that's one possible source. Um, I have a feeling that, you know, that it, it may have been a combination of things because in one individual, it's sort of a low, slow um, elevation. And in the other individual, it looks like two events. So, you know, it may be that there was environmental contamination in one case, and it may have been, you know, an event like a, a combustion um, or something that would have led to that, you know, punctuated, you know, we're talking about lead coming into the body over a period of just a couple of weeks. I but it's a great question. Laura's question. So I just open up the feed. Yeah, everybody can ask each other questions too. Yeah, please don't wait for me. Sorry, you have a question? Uh, we cannot hear you, sorry, you're muted. I think, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, can you hear now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, people can use three rings uh, to reconstruct uh, climate during significant period, periods of time. So basically, matching uh, uh, different patterns. Uh, do you think something like that might be possible with with teeth? Somehow, we just you need to have kind of multiple samples from about this uh, from about the same area and kind of mash them together so you can get a pattern not just during the lifetime of a, like a child but uh, across several generations maybe just, I, just to... I, I think it's highly unlikely i mean teeth uh, the tree rings can go for thousands of years in a single tree and you can match trees across trees and we know that particularly in new zealand you know you've got thousands of years of prehistory represented yeah. Um, teeth really, you know, molar crown of a primate tends to only record a few years. And, and I've been able to put together, like in some of these orangutans, the first, second and third molar. So I've got a nine year record sampled on a weekly basis. Um, and, and that's actually a pretty serious accomplishment. But to go for decades is, is really difficult because the associations between individuals would be really hard to establish. Okay, thanks. Makes but I sense. wish. It would be amazing. I mean, I think you know, again, this is this is the, the problem of the fossil record. It's so fragmentary. And so we often, you know, we're left with just tiny, tiny amounts of information. But 
But I can say this, a lot of the previous work on oxygen isotopes has suggested that, you know, early hominins, you know, inhabited a very, you know, kind of narrow range of oxygen isotope values suggesting a particular environment. I see that entire range of 3 million years in a single tooth sampled on a weekly scale. So a lot of these arguments about paleo environments that are constructed on a single bulk sample point don't, under, don't reflect the natural variation that occurs just in three years of, of an organism's life. And so it really suggests we have to be a bit careful about some of these um, bulk approaches to getting at, you know, plyopleistocene transitions, for example. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks again. I think we're out of time, but it, uh, Ashkul, thank you for organizing us and thanks to everybody at the university for hosting. Oh. Yeah, thank you for joining us. It was fascinating to hear all your research. It's just um, such a great start to the series. Um, and uh, thank you for your time and your um, sharing your ideas with us. So we, I'll um, close the webinar soon. And I just want to tell everyone that we look forward to having you back in July on the 2nd so for another round of amazing research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you.